Thank you, um, Isabella and uh, Johnny, this morning for the worship. Um, we're so grateful for uh, everything everyone's contributed. Thank you, Joe, for that wonderful word uh, this morning. And um, I want to just uh, add just a little bit to what Joe has said um, about that wonderful uh, uh, hymn. I'm just going to just focus on one verse here. It's Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And uh, Ayung read this beautifully out uh, to us just now. And let me just read this to you again. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the government will be upon peace of his government and of peace there will be no end. That's Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. And I want to focus on this thought this morning. His name will be called Wonderful. What does it mean, this word wonderful? When my dear mother-in-law, some of you will remember her, Ellen, uh, in her closing days, um, it was a word that was always on her lips. I remember the last conversation we had with her uh, before she went to be with Jesus was, it's wonderful. Everything was wonderful. In fact, in that last conversation, she said, I can hear singing. It's wonderful. And I looked up wonderful in the dictionary, and this is what it said. A feeling of surprised or puzzled interest, sometimes tinged with admiration. So it's something good, isn't it? It's something surprising. It's something unexpected. It's something interesting. It's something amazing. <clears throat> it's Christmas time. And for children, uh, Christmas is wonderful in the sense that it is a, a time of wonder. Um, <clears throat> when we have this sense of wonder, it's, it's often something that we've never experienced before. And even at Christmas time, there's a bit of wonder for us, isn't there? We wonder what it is in those presents. When the children have been getting the, um, the, uh, the, the, the grabber prizes, they probably wondered what's in that package. There's a sense of wonder. I would be lying to you this morning if I didn't say to you that the most wonderful thing in my life was when I was 17 years old um, and at, at school. In fact, I just turned 17. It was the first week, um, uh, the first Sunday of January 1974. And somebody told me that I ought to ask Jesus into my heart. In fact, it would be good for me. And at that time in my life, I thought, they're probably right. I need to do this. And you can probably see the, the place there, if Phil uh, has put that up for you, the place circled. Um, just that little, the front room was just there. It was a real thing. That Sunday, I asked Jesus to come into my life to be my Lord and to be my Savior. And it was a wonderful thing. It was really surprising. In fact, when I woke up the next morning, having experienced nothing the day before, Suddenly, my heart, I just woke up and my heart was filled with happiness. I felt so clean. I felt so happy. And I went on that cloud for several weeks and I told everybody I knew that what I had found was wonderful, that Jesus was wonderful. Question I have for you this morning, uh, is he wonderful to you today? Just going back a slide, Phil. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, it explains a guy called Moses, one of my favorite Bible characters. And um, the scene is that Moses is standing at the top of a mountain, looking into the promised land. And God has said to him, no, Moses, you've brought them this far, but you can't go into the promised land. And Moses is so disappointed. And it says, and I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, oh, Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. But what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? 
You'll remember this Moses was the, the man who with wonder saw the burning bush. He was in the desert and suddenly he saw this bush that was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. This was the Moses that had opened up the Red Sea. This was the Moses that had struck the rock and water had poured out. So many miracles. But he said, you've only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. You see, he had not lost that sense of wonder. Sarah Crawley uh, was uh, saying the other day in the prayer meeting, uh, just recalling how uh, how she used to be so excited going to her home group because it was unexpected. You didn't know what God was going to do. Have we got that sense of wonder? You know, we can pray again, Jesus, reveal your wonder to me again. Another wonderful thing is when a child is born. Do you remember a few weeks ago, uh, Natalie um, uh, had a child, Natalie and Aston, to them a child was born, and that child was uh, called Aston. And at that time, it was wonderful to them. It was wonderful that, to them that knew them. But actually, the Bible says in this chapter, for unto us, unto us, a child is born. I've got a picture here. Uh, Monica pointed out that this is Barbara's favorite sculpture. You'll find it in St. Martin's in the Fields in the crypt. And it's, a, it's called the Christ Child. And it's a realistic picture um, in the sculptor's imagination of what it would have been like. Jesus was born. Maybe he was laid on the sand. He was just in a manger. And he was born naked into this earth, just like the rest of us. Unto us, a child was born. Unto us a son was given. And at that time, uh, Mary and Joseph, they went into the temple to dedicate Jesus. And the prophet Simeon came up to Mary and said, a sword will pierce your soul because of this child. Because this child was destined not just to be born, but to, to actually die for us. The Bible says in this verse, unto us a son is given. My favorite verse in the Bible is definitely John 3.16. And it says this, God loved the world so much that he, what did he do? He gave his only son that whoever put their trust in him would not perish but have eternal life. None of us wants to perish. It says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And, you know, of all the people in the world, we are the ones that do not need to fear COVID-19 because we do not need to fear death. And there are many people that have been taken. I was listening to, what, to a local pastor the other day, and during this pandemic, he had lost 12 friends, relatives and um, uh, people in a ministry. How sad. And he looked pretty sad for it. I saw him a few weeks later and he was bright and breezy as ever because his hope goes beyond death. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus has paid the price that we might have eternal life by laying down his own life for us. It was a perfect life. It had to be a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for our sin. Matthew 3 and 17 says this, a voice I heard from heaven saying, this is my one dear son. In him, I take great delight. Do you know, however good you are, however good you've been, it will never be enough to get you to heaven. There is only one that is good enough. And God said, in him, I take great delight. And he was, as it says in the Anglican communion, a full, perfect and sufficient. That means enough sacrifice for our sins we could never be good enough but he was and then it says in romans 8 32 since he did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all won't he also give us everything else you see god loves us so not only did he give us jesus but he gave us everything that we need he would he gave us the holy spirit to enable us to live this life of jesus out in this world he gives us everything we need it says in philippians 4 19 my god shall supply all your need not all your greed mind all your need 
So his name will be called Wonderful. We haven't got time to go into everything, but I just want to focus on one more thing in that verse, that his name is Prince of Peace. And boy, do we need that at the moment. Do you know, they did a survey, and during that survey, they discovered that in the, in the year from uh, January uh, to May, just over a year uh, this year, um, the, uh, the, the occurrences of anxiety disorders had increased threefold. Why is that? Because there is a lot more to worry about in our world at this time. We worry about getting ill. There's never been a bigger time for our generation to worry about that. We worry, uh, there is worry about losing a job, about our income. We worry about our mental health. There is worry about feeling lonely, and there is worry about even dying. Have you noticed that when you're worried, very often something happens at the back of your neck? It kind of gets into your shoulders, doesn't it? And in Romans, um, sorry, in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it goes on and it says this. It says that the government will be upon his shoulder. There's a picture there um, of a firefighter carrying somebody on his shoulders. God has made our shoulders to carry things. And what a wonderful thing to know that the government of our life is on his shoulders. Everything in us wants to govern our own life. We want to control our existence, control our time, control everything that happens to us, control our finance, have everything worked out. But God doesn't want it that way. He says the government should be on his shoulder. Romans 15, 13 says this, may the God of hope fill you, that's you and I, with all joy and peace as we trust in him, as we put our trust in him. I remember the probably one of the worst times in my life was when my son was in hospital. He was having an operation on his kidney, um, and uh, nobody uh, of that age, he was only two years, had ever had that operation done. And it was potentially a worrying time. My business was going through the mill. We were in the middle of a recession. We were finding it very hard to pay our bills. Uh, I had anxiety about the way that our family was coping with it. Both Joe and I were finding this very strained. And yet my testimony is God provided for us. He gave us friends who came. They took the strain. They they visited uh, uh, James when he was in hospital. Um, the the people uh, gave money. I had we had a check from Scotland for two thousand pounds from somebody who didn't know the difficulty we were in, and it was the the day when I was going to have to go into work, unable to pay the wages. You see, it's not just a theory. God loves us and he provides for us. And I have learned to trust in him. So Jesus said in Matthew 11, and this is for us this morning, this is our takeaway thought, come to me, all of you who are tired. Are you tired today? Are you tired of this pandemic? Did you think this was bad enough? And now they've taken Christmas away as well. I can't be with my family. I can't see my grandchildren. All these bad things. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are tired from having carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. I'm going to find just here a testimony from today, if I can find it. Um, and uh, somebody I just texted this morning their, their, their own experience. And where are we? Here we go. They've been very disappointed by the news of what was happening to, to the family and to the children in this pandemic. Um, and uh, this person said, broke the news to the girls, a few tears. And then having potentially been quite de depressed and discouraged by this, this is what this couple did. They said, we also listed all the things we were thankful for and felt filled with joy because they sensibly <laughs> turned their eyes on Jesus and put their trust in him. It says in Matthew 11, it goes on and says, take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me. You see, the yoke is a thing that joins two animals together. And God himself, this mighty God, has offered his own shoulders to carry our bur burdens. He says, come to me and now let me take control of your life. Let me, this benevolent master, take, your, take the strain. 
Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. And there's a promise here. You will find rest for your soul. And I found that to be true many times. And then it says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, it says of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And what it's saying here is that the more God has the government of our lives. Do you remember when I, in 1974 I asked Jesus to come into my life as my saviour, but also as my Lord? And if we will trust him with our lives and say, God, whatever it is you have for me, whatever circumstances you want to put me through, whatever it is you have for me to do in this life, I want to obey you. I'm taking that yoke on myself. And do you remember that picture, Revelation 3, verse 20? And this is the final thought this morning. And there it is, Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts. He said, look, I'm, I'm knocking at your heart. And do you know he is knocking at all our hearts. Every day he is knocking. Children, teenagers, adults, can you hear him knocking? He's saying, let me come in. Let me carry the burden. Let me take control of your whole life and I will fill you with all peace and joy. Father, we just pray this morning, as Joe has said, we think of that verse in O little town of Bethlehem, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Father, refresh us, renew us. If we've lost that sense of wonder, Father, would you give it back to us this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much to listen, for listening to that. Uh, we're going to just now uh, uh, go back to that nativity play. And as we just go back to that now, don't just look at the, uh, 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 the fun families uh, doing the, this, but let the words sink in, let this story sink in and let it become real to you today. <laughs> 